whatever. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and screen share um, and give my little presentation. And then I'm sure I'll, you know, I talk kind of fast, so I'm sure I'll leave like plenty of time for questions at the end. So, um, and also like along the way, if you have any um, questions that you just want to put in the chat, I'll just like try to answer them as I go. Um, I like to keep these things pretty casual. So uh, anyway, um, like Emily said, I'm Rachel. Um, I got my BFA uh, from Washington University in St. Louis here um, three years ago. So it's been a little bit over three years since I've been um, out of undergrad and I chose to like not hop to New York immediately. Um, I decided to stay in St. Louis and kind of foster the connections that I had here. Um, and, you know, have had fortunately a good number of shows in St. Louis. Um, so I'm going to run through like kind of the work that led me up to the Great Rivers Biennial, which is my current show that's open at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis. And then also give you like more like behind the scenes photos and videos of like the horrible mess that my studio was like the entire year, like leading up to that show. Um, so yeah. Also, I haven't given an artist talk in like a really long time and it was kind of amazing getting to like compile all these images um, of the work that I've made because I tend to just like forget that I've made all of this stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I thought I'd just start with um, actually my like thesis work when I was um, in undergrad. Uh, funny story, I actually entered WashU thinking I was going to be like an illustration major um, cause I was always like drawing and painting based. Um, and then I like tried sculpture and really loved problem solving and being able to like create objects in real space and time. Um, and so that's how I ended up being a sculptor. Um, my thesis work for Wash U, um, was this body of like furniture that I made, um, out of foam. And, um, this really kind of started this interest that I had in, um, everyday objects and um, the idea that like objects can like you can expect them to do something and they can totally like betray you and just like flop on you. Um, so I constructed um, yeah like a chair, a coffee table, a planter and like a picture frame um, and I'd kind of I'd coded them to like look like Carrara marble um, because you know, a couple years we were like at the height of like the marble trend where like everything was marble print. Um, and I liked kind of poking fun at the fact that, you know, we love the image of marble, but um, marble itself is kind of an expensive material. And so we're kind of like shortcutting this like look of like luxury. Um, so yeah, these kind of performative objects and performance itself has always kind of been integral to my work. Um, and so some of my work I've actually created videos with, um, so I'll, I have a lot of like little video clips in this presentation, um, but I'll go ahead and start with this one where I actually like tried to use the furniture and it like clearly went terribly. Um, this is just a 30 second clip from a four minute video. Yeah, it was fun. I got to mop up that coffee um, after the performance. Um, but yeah, I, I love being able to like make these objects and also kind of activate them in space. Um, I did something similar um, right after I graduated. I had a show coming up at the Militzer Gallery, um, which is now closed, um, but it's in South City um, where I made kind of on the theme of like marble and like these kind of classical uh, materials, um, I decided to replicate um, a six foot tall freestanding column um, out of silicone. Um, and this is like made with like silicone caulk, which is like the stuff you use to like caulk your bathtub. 
um, my studio smelled incredibly bad <laughs> for like the next month afterwards. Um, but I, I liked, you know, this um, kind of reverence that we have for like Greek and Roman architecture and culture um, and um, yeah, how it's kind of like a foundation for our um, identity as a national or as a nation. And so, um, you know, even like things like the White House and the Supreme Court and all these kind of federal buildings are based on this architectural style, um, which I think is funny because, you know, we are this really proud country, but um, our identity is peace from, um, yeah, like other cultures as well. Um, so yeah, I have this, um, like this six foot long, um, kind of flaccid column. Um, it kind of felt like a body. Um, I would like transport it to like the show and I would like buckle it into like, you know, a seatbelt, like in my car and drive it around. And, um, it really became this like kind of schlump thing. Um, and this weight. And I just love that, you know, it was this, this symbol and I kind of took away its rigidity and its structure from it. Um, uh, I also filmed a video with this um, piece as well in 2018. Um, and so this is also just a short clip from that. And in this video, my column and I, I like carried it around downtown St. Louis and we like viewed other neoclassical columns together in the city. Um, my shoulder was very sore the next day. Um, and I happened to be carrying it out at the same time that like a big Cardinals game had let out. So like suddenly downtown was full of like a lot of drunk people uh, who were like, oh my God, it's broken or like, yelling at me from across the street like that looks funny anyway it was it was delightful getting to see people's reactions um, so yeah so i continued on um making kind of like soft sculpture or sculptures that were kind of um shifted forms um, so this is a folding screen um that you know people have in their homes they act as dividers um, but a lot of them are like I guess I was really interested in how um, sometimes people like collect these like Asian or like Eastern looking objects because they like bring this idea of like that a person is cultured or like worldly or well-traveled. Um, and so I made this uh, with fabric from Joann's actually, um, which I thought was just kind of like generic looking oriental style fabric. Um, and then of course the whole thing can't stand up. So it has to be pinned to the wall. And it's kind of just like this pathetic, like sad thing. Um, I really, I think in my work, I've found that I really like identify with objects. Like I love when objects express human qualities. Um, it's just like a funny thing of life. Um, like I was, I remember like a couple of years ago, um, Arizona had like an incredibly bad, like um, heat index, like they uh, record breaking um, temperatures and like people's like mailboxes started like melting and like their trash cans started melting and like things were just like falling apart and it was like the saddest most tragic thing but also kind of funny um, and I love using humor to be able to kind of express um, you know difficult subjects or um, feelings about like culture or identity Um, yeah, this is another kind of piece in that same vein. This is Bad Boy, uh, which is a table that I had uh, created to look like an animal that was like scratching the walls. Because when I was growing up, I had this poodle named Leon um, that would just like, whenever he had to pee, he'd like go to the door and like scratch the door. And my parents like hated it because he was just like scratching at the paint. Um, and so I kind of gave that same personality to this table. Um, which ended up really reminding me of the, uh, the footrest from Beauty and the Beast, if you've seen that movie. Um, so yeah, so I started to think about, you know, I love this kind of animated quality to objects. And I decided that I wanted my sculptures to move. 
um, I didn't really know how to do that necessarily um, because I like I studied art and like not engineering. Um, and so I decided like, okay, I need like motors, uh, but I need to be able to appropriate them from something that exists already. Um, and that's what led me to go and start buying massagers, which kind of was snowballed into the work that I have now. Um, but this is the first piece that I made that um, incorporates movement. So I'll go ahead and play that. Um, so yeah, I took these like bamboo poles and essentially attached them to um, this shiatsu massager, um, which is a slow moving motor. Uh, but I also was like really kind of fascinated with the massager as just like an object, like it's this like plasticky, you know, kind of space agey weird looking form um, that people sell on like, you know, home shopping networks. And uh, they have, you know, typically these like knobs that rotate and they're kind of starting to like try to imitate like thumbs pressing into your skin or to your feet. And they're kind of like surrogate people for that reason. Um, and yeah, I just like that. It was like, it was kind of like a shortcut to like intimacy or to touch. Um, and a lot of these massagers um, have heat in them and they like warm your feet as they massage you. And I thought that was just like so weird, um, but I loved it. Uh, so I started, oh, yeah, so I just like continued to, um, I don't know, to like attach plants to massagers. I wish I could tell you I had like a really profound reason for doing this, but it was kind of just like, I just wanted to see like what would happen if I, you know, put these plasticky things, um, appendages onto this moving base. And I like totally loved the effect. Like um, this one is called Two Young Men Fanning Senior Woman with Palm Fronds by Poole. And I just love that it kind of looked like these two like battling things. Like the, it really started to develop its own personality. Sometimes the fronds would get like twisted up in each other like they were wrestling. Um, and I really started just like loving that kind of personality that was coming out of the work itself. Um, Here's another piece uh, called poolside. Um, so another kind of massager um, contraption thing that I attached a palm to. And I, I made it to kind of imitate like, you know that like classic scene where somebody's like reclining and like eating grapes and like somebody's like fanning them um, in this act of servitude. Um, I really liked this kind of idea of like, um, having like a machine like kind of fan you as if they were like adoring you and like pampering you. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes they got kind of like suggestive <laughs> in weird ways, um, but I really like that. get the point. Um, so when I, um, last year in 2019, I had the opportunity to go to Vermont Studio Center um, on a fellowship. Um, and out there I started just like kind of continuing the same work, um, like using massagers, um, driving out um, to uh, various like thrift stores um, or individual sellers. Um, buying massagers and starting to kind of like stage them in relationship to each other because in in the past I'd only shown these pieces like one at a time. Um, I like tried attaching real plants to them and they would just kind of wilt and like shake all their leaves off. Um, and then this is a piece that I made with um, these like leg massagers but they're like air pumps so like you wrap this like cuff around your calves and it inflates air and kind of like massages your leg um, and compresses it. Um, but I created these like silicone rocks um, and inserted that pump into it. So it's really subtle, but like the, the rocks kind of like breathe and they move.
So yeah. Um, yeah, just like a few more. I started to really, again, kind of think like in the titling, think of um, how these um, machines or massagers were like, uh, like worshipers or um, yeah, devotees. That's one. Um, I liked with this olive branch one, the way that they kind of like embrace or like they look like they're slow dancing together. Um, and this is kind of the point where I started to like really think of these pieces as dancing. Um, and then uh, for this exhibition called the Terrain Biennial, um, which is an outdoor biennial that happens in cities all across the US. Um, I did this uh, installation in Springfield in a storefront where I had this like giant palm um, attached to a sign waving motor um because you can like buy a motor attach a sign to it and like put a mannequin out in the street and like it will like do the sign movement like the way that people do when they're like hey like here's like you know firehouse subs is this way um and i actually had attached a motion sensor um to this one so like whenever somebody walked in front of it or passed it like the palm would start like dancing at you. Um, and I really kind of like this level of interaction that was happening. And it was kind of like excited to see you. Uh, so yeah, so that was my main body of work in 2019. Um, I was uh, on my way back from Vermont, like driving across the country and then found out that I was one of the finalists for the 2020 Great Rivers Biennial. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the biennial, it's every two years, there's a juried competition hosted by the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis and the Gateway Foundation. Um, and they select um, jurors from across like the United States and like the professional art field. Um, who then like visit St. Louis and interview which with each of the 10 finalists and then ultimately select three, um, three artists to be part of the biennial and actually have an exhibition at CAM. Um, this was kind of like nuts to me that this, <laughs> that I like, that I got this. Um, I, I, I don't know, I guess I was really nervous for my studio visit. Um, I had the three jurors this year were Jose Carlos Diaz, who's the chief curator at the Warhol Museum. Um, Christopher Wailu is one of the curators of the Whitney. And Amanda Ross Ho, who is um, an artist in California. Um, and so with this kind of um, studio visit, um, I'm really like fortunate to have like a really large studio space. Um, I work at the Bermuda Project, which is an exhibition space up in Ferguson. Um, and I used the gallery space to kind of like stage my own exhibition. I started placing the um, massager pieces in relationship to each other. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately wrote this proposal where, you know, a person would walk through this path of like, um, of massagers um, that were all like swaying these plants at you. Um, the original idea or inspiration behind that was um, like the story from the Bible where Jesus like walks through um, Jerusalem and like everybody's like fanning him with palms. And like, um, I grew up like really religiously. Uh, my dad is like a Baptist pastor uh, and this comes into play later in the show. But um, I think I was really kind of thinking about religion and spirituality at the time that I was writing um, the proposal at that time to like Notre Dame had also just like burned and um, it was kind of this um, yeah this weird like kind of moment of heartache for the world um, and so I kind of started to think about like my own spirituality and like upbringing and also like my complex and like combative relationship with religion too um, and yeah that's what led me to the Great Rivers Biennial um, so I have these like nice kind of like polished photos of the show, um, but I actually have a ton of like in progress shots I'd like to show you. 
Um, but if you haven't gotten to see the show, it's open until February, so you have time to see it. Um, but basically, it's this like dance floor um, of massagers and plants, and they're all just like dancing. They're just going for it, and there's like a disco ball in the middle. Um, and there's also two audio tracks that are playing. One of the audio tracks is um, like a dance beat. And that was something I commissioned um, a local band to create, um, which is really awesome to be able to have the resources to collaborate. Um, yeah, it's, it's totally a plant party and it's like super colorful. Um, it's actually like, if you've been to CAM, it's like the last gallery, like it's gallery C and it's just kind of more enclosed space. And you're like, are, you know, you walk into the museum, you kind of hear this like music track going on in the back and you're like, what's that? Uh, and then you round this corner and there's just like this huge frenzy going on. Um, but yeah, so on, on one hand, there's this dance track playing, um, but there's also um, church music playing too at the same time. Um, and the church music is actually taken from um, various like Korean church service recordings that I would found online. Um, I'll go back, I'll go into that um, in a little bit, but yeah, these are just um, images of the show. The, uh, yeah, the installation is, um, you might notice that like over time, it's going to start tearing itself apart more and more um, just by nature of like things moving for like 20 to 30 hours a week for like five months um, and everything being like plastic motors and like, you know, crappy parts and like these like home, uh, home massagers. Um, they're kind of fighting entropy. Like, I mean, they're really just going to fall apart. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it's this really like kind of glorious presentation of like, you know, over like 50 massagers, massagers um, and like lights and music. Um, but I kind of wanted to show like what it looked like getting ready for that show. Um, before in St. Louis, like whenever I had exhibited my work, everything was like kind of smaller group shows that I had maybe like a month to three months to prepare for. Um, and suddenly like I had this like one exhibition to spend like an, almost an entire year on which then got further extended because of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I also will say that like, this was like completely different than like the proposal I'd written. Um, like I had, you know, maybe a general idea of like what I would do with a museum show, but when it came to actually making it, um, I found that I had to like really respond to the work um, and what it wanted. Um, so the first part of the show was collecting a lot of stuff. Um, because my work is found objects, um, I spent a lot of time on Facebook Marketplace um, messaging anybody who was selling like a massager like this. Um, and yeah, my process is really just like messaging people, coordinating, picking up, um, exchanging cash for these. Um, I drove pretty much everywhere in like a 30 mile radius of St. Louis, um, including like Southern Illinois, like all the way to like Pacific and like High Ridge and um, to like St. Peter's. Um, and so that kind of really became part of my art practice was just driving around like the entire Great Rivers area. Um, and just like, yeah, doing individual sales, meeting with people, um, you know, they would be like, oh, this is an amazing massager. Like, it's, it's awesome. Like, it feels so good. And I'm like, so why are you selling it? And they're like, I just don't use it anymore. Um, and I, I think I really fell in love with this, um, this kind of endearing quality of these objects that were meant to perform this function of like comfort and intimacy and then like fell short and were ultimately, um, you know, sold secondhand. Um, I kind of, I think it's funny. I mean, I, this never happened, but I thought it would always be funny if somebody like sold me a massager and then I opened my car and they had seen that I had also bought like 10 massagers that day. They probably would have thought it was like really, really weird. And there were a couple times that I bought a massager from the same person like months later. And they were like, I remember you. And I'm like, hi again, <laughs> I'm back for another massager. 
So anyway, that was that was a bulk of the, the kind of like the first few months of planning. Um, I also decided that I wanted the um, these pieces to be kind of elevated off the ground or like at different heights. Um, whereas before I had always displayed them um, just on the floor. So I started collecting um, old speaker cabinets from like the 50s to the 70s, 80s era um, that had these like really amazing like kind of wood bodies and um, beautiful lattices or like knit covers, um, stuff that you can't really find today. But also they, the speakers you can get today are much smaller and much better in their sound quality. These, these all kind of sounded really bad, but um, but yeah, my studio just became like a giant mess of objects. Um, I just like was making as many massager pieces as I could, um, kind of just figuring, you know, I, my basic process is like buying a massager, taking it apart, um, seeing how I could attach a plant and then choosing plants based on like what kind of motion I wanted. Um, some massagers just spin, you know, in a circle some of them spin at like an angle. Um, some of them vibrate like really crazily and some of them kind of sway back and forth. Um, so I was really kind of playing with that movement. I spent way too much money at Michael's and like Hobby Lobby buying tons of fake plants. Um, and I recommend if you ever have to do that to like make sure that there's a sale going on. Um, so yeah, this is just like what my studio looked like it was just like <laughs> massagers and like, and plants just like falling over and failing like, um, it's definitely taken me a long time to figure out how to make these last. Um, and even right now, like in the show at CAM there, some of them are falling apart, as I mentioned before. Um, but yeah. And let me see. Yeah, and then this is um, again where I started to like elevate them on the speaker cabinets. Um, yeah, there, there goes that one again, it just it fell. Fortunately, that one's doing okay in the show currently. Um, but yeah, I also wanted to show, so when I, I mentioned that like, you know, I had this whole year to work on the show. I have this plan that I had for my proposal my original proposal had like a fountain in it too. I'm kind of glad I didn't end up making that, but um, but things ultimately changed like in that year, like as I made the work, the work kind of demanded something else. Um, and there was this particular night I was in the studio and my partner slash studio mate was playing guitar. Like he was just playing music um, and I was working on my sculptures and they were just kind of, you know, doing their thing. Um, and we both kind of had this moment where we were like looking at the sculptures, listening to the music and we were like, oh, like this show needs music. And that's definitely not where I started. Like I was, it was going to be this like very like austere, like white cube gallery presentation of these objects. Um, and, and that totally shifted gears in like December. Um, and so, yeah, this is like kind of the exact moment um, that I was like, oh, it needs music. Um, so yeah, I, I totally shifted gears. It was really scary to like decide to change courses, but I'm ultimately really happy that I did. Um, side note, if you're wondering what this like blue rectangle is, uh, Ryan and I used to also play roller hockey in our gallery space. Um, so you can kind of see where this, the floor got really scuffed up, but um, yeah, we, we do a lot with that space. So I did the next logical step was just to like buy a disco ball. Um, and 
uh, I went to Guitar Center. And if you've ever been to Guitar Center, there's like a section in the back where like it's kind of dark and carpeted and they have like all these different stage and like club lights going. I highly recommend visiting. That's really cool. Um, but I just, you know, I walked out with a disco ball um, and yeah, just uh, I got like some colored lights um, and you know, set up the disco ball and just started to kind of piece the show together into what it became. Um, and originally I had been um, like playing music off of Spotify. Like I was um, playing a lot of disco music as I was working on this show. Um, but I actually decided um, to work with um, musicians like from St. Louis, um, which was a really, again, a cool opportunity that was really only possible because of the funding from this show. Um, but I worked with a local band um, called God's Bod, um, and which was a very fitting title for this show. Um, but they created about like a 20 minute dance track. Um, and I don't have clips of that music here, but um, if you go to Cam, you'll be able to hear the, the whole thing. Um, and then, yeah. So, you know, I knew that I wanted music, um, but the show actually continued to like evolve. Um, I had mentioned that I grew up really religiously um, and I grew up in like Korean Baptist churches um, my whole life. My uh, and a really important part of that growing up was that the um, the we would like lead these like really intense prayer services um, where like we'd turn the lights down and like turn this music up and like people would like cry out to God and like shake their arms and like shake their fists and like um, you know, be swaying back and forth and kind of really like possessed by this, like the Holy Spirit, I guess. Um, and I started to kind of see that relationship to the work I was making. Like on one hand, they were like dancing kind of um, happily and ecstatically. And then on the other hand, they also kind of looked like they were like worshiping. Um, so I also like were, was doing experiments where I was pairing um, this video installation with uh, church music that I'd found online um, that was very reminiscent of like the music I grew up with. Um, so this is like a mock up of that. So yeah, if you've ever been in like a Baptist church, like, I don't know, the music is really important and like the clapping and the swaying. And, um, and so I decided to really like bring that part into this installation. Um, and that's a part that's like very kind of like intimate to, to the way I grew up. Oh, I just learned that you can't hear the audio. I'm so sorry. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's Korean church music, I guess. Um, that's weird. I don't know why the audio won't work. It says we're imagining it, so. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, um, well, I guess the next video also like won't be that great, but uh, I just wanted to show like um, the video that um, that Cam produced of the of uh, of the show, just to give you kind of a sense of what it looks like to be in that space. And um, I find that like all of my work really has to be documented by video now. Um, if you reshare your screen, you can press share computer audio. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try that. Will everybody bear with me for a second while I do that? Okay. Yes, we will. Okay. Oh, share computer sound. Amazing. Okay, let's try that again. Thank you so much, um, yeah, for uh, 
Yeah, thanks, Abigail, for that. <laughs> I did not know. Um, so yeah, I I started to really think about um, how I grew up in these church spaces where, you know, again, it was something that was really integral to like my growing up, like Korean churches and like communities really important, but also something I never really felt that I belonged in um, because of like my, you know, being American, growing up in America, um, ultimately trying to, um, yeah, to be in like proximity to like whiteness and stuff like that. Like um, I had always felt really at odds with the way I grew up. Um, and so I, I always found myself like in these situations where like everybody was like praying around me and like really intensely like possessed by the Holy Spirit. And I would just be like standing there, like not feeling it. Um, and I also kind of related this experience to like just being like an adolescent at like any sort of dance um, where I don't know if you can relate, but like going to high school dances was, you know, exciting, but also kind of like nerve wracking. Um, and, you know, I was like one of the people that was like plastered against the wall um, because I just like didn't know how to move my body. And I like, I still am terrible at dancing. Um, but I, I, you know, kind of felt like I was creating this environment that like replicated that feeling for myself or like I was just the still person while everything was like dancing around me. Um, okay, so now that we have the audio resolved, I'll play this um, video, which has um, kind of like the intro song, none of like the dancey songs um, from the installation, but has a, you know, combines like the prayer and this um, guitar anthem. So I will go ahead and play that. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, the most anointed name, the most exalted name, the name above the earth, The name above all names. Father, be glorified here today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, as I speak to your people. Please open their spiritual ears and their spiritual eyes that they may hear this and see this in the mighty name of Jesus. Um, so yeah, from there, it kind of turns into this um, dance track and you can still hear the, the Korean prayer sounds. Um, but yeah, this show was really kind of my way of reconciling um, both this like religious upbringing that I had, but also kind of, um, I don't know, also like kind of queer spaces like um, where I don't know, for, for a lot of like queer people, like dance and like these kind of celebratory like club or sp club spaces are like um, where they find family and, and community. And I think, you know, these, to most people, those worlds are like separate. Um, but I think I was really trying to find the ways um, that people have in common that they um, move their body and are like vulnerable in space with other people um, in this kind of congregation um, together. So yeah, that's the end of my like presentation. Uh, happy to take any questions right now. And also that's like my shameless plug for 
sorry, uh, that's my shameless plug for uh, my Instagram, my website, and my email if you ever want to get in touch with me. Um, and then if you have heard the music um, from the show and really like it, um, this is uh, God's Bod's website where you can listen to their tracks. Um, they also have some really amazing um, ASL interpretation videos of their music um, that I highly recommend checking out too. Um, cool. I'm going to stop screen sharing okay. and uh, answer any questions that people have. Like you can either unmute yourself and ask or just put them in the chat. Yeah. All right, guys, we, we've got Rachel for a little bit longer. Um, so does anybody have any questions that they want to start off uh, either about uh, their practice in general or about the show at the camp? or even maybe even the process of applying slash getting the GRB. I know a lot of people have questions about that. Yeah, I highly recommend anybody, like I think you have to graduate undergrad first to apply, but once you're out of school, um, it's a great opportunity. Um, and yeah, you never know. I mean, um, my general advice for that process is to, <laughs> to be yourself. Like, I know that's like the most corny thing like I could possibly say, um, but being like a finalist, like I was very much like in over my head. Like I was really nervous about that interview, like that studio visit where they like come and like ask you about your work and like you have to like answer tough questions sometimes. Um, but I really treated it as like just a conversation. Um, and, you know, fortunately the jurors were really nice and um, yeah, it just like worked out. Like I actually kind of like when they left my studio, I forgot like why they were there. And then I was like, oh, it was for this really important thing. Um, and even if like you, you know, like don't get it or like you're a finalist and you don't receive the award, it's like your work is like still in front of those people's eyes. And like, they're still like, you know, looking at your work, reading your statements. Um, and so I think it's always great to apply. Oh. And Tate also has gotten the GRB too. So he's a great person to talk to. Don't bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, I was going to ask about, um, I know this is a little bit of a departure from GRB stuff, but I wondered if you could talk about Bermuda um, and just what you and Ryan, you know, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if Ryan really championed that or if you did, but kind of how that works is a companion to your own studio practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I'd love an update too, where, where it even stands right now, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I um, run the Bermuda Project gallery space up in Ferguson, Missouri. That was started by Ryan Doyle in 2017. And then I kind of um, started helping him with that early 2019. Um, but it's really like, you know, an artist run project space. Um, and we organize shows, um, you know, several times a year. Um, we do our best to put um, St. Louis artists in conversation with artists like from around the country. Um, and yeah, and it's a great way to kind of just like bring people like out of St. Louis city and like a county like into Ferguson um, to see art. Um, we're really blessed with like this amazing like 1500 square foot gallery space, um, which was like my workshop space for the past like year basically. Um, but yeah, I would love to see some of you there um, for any openings. We're currently like not open um, because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, we're hoping by like spring 2021 to have to have some shows too. Do you take a pretty active role in curating that work together too? I'm trying to think about like active or working as a curator alongside being a, a practicing artist. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know. I don't necessarily see myself as like a formal curator and like that being my main practice. Um, I really like the opportunity to like connect with other artists. Um, that I normally wouldn't have the opportunity to. Um, yeah, until I kind of stage it in this space. Um, you know, we're not a commercial gallery, so we can be like a little bit more experimental with how we hang people, people's works. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, like, you know, we don't like receive funding or anything. It's, it's totally a labor of love. Um, but being able to like make those relationships is, um, is really important too. Yes, yeah, it seems real lucrative. 
Yeah. <laughs> there's there's merit to it, Tate. It's it's expanding expanding the the circle of people you know. No, if money's not involved, I'm not interested. <laughs> um, but I, I no, I mean, I really do like that. I mean, Bermuda, it's always seemed like this startup thing that was just existed to show art. And I love that kind of being the number one championing thing. I think a lot of our students that are going to be graduating soon are thinking about how do I take this into the real world and how do I take this last four years um, into the real world? And I think, you know, Ryan uh, kind of showing that we've gone through many cycles of this in St. Louis, either on Cherokee or Bermuda up in Ferguson, you know, of this like uh, students graduating and then trying to, to make a go of this thing. And I think um, it's been cool to see that happening for sure. Yeah, St. Louis has been blessed with a lot of um, really awesome, just like like more artist run spaces. Um, and, you know, that's also a reason um, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but why I decided to stay in St. Louis was because um, as an undergrad, like I make I made it a point to to go see shows like wherever I could and to to kind of get it out into the art scene. And I am by no means like an extroverted networky person, but I would just like go out and try to meet people. Um, and St. Louis is a great place to like start an art career too, to, to, you know, that you can find opportunities to show to even like have like a solo opportunity. Um, and I was, you know, really blessed to, to have those opportunities um, coming right out of undergrad. Um, but also like St. Louis, I don't know. I mean, I could, you could argue about like why, like it's great to like move to New York and all the opportunities you have there, but, you know, being in St. Louis, like you have resources, you have space, um, and yeah, it's just a great place to be an artist. So I guess one of my questions would be, uh, is there a plan for what's next now that you've gotten through this, this year, kind of? I, I wish I knew. And I, I, I think a lot of artists in, are in this space where like, you know, because of COVID, like, a lot of opportunities that might have happened, um, you know, or maybe on hold. Mm -hmm. um, I was supposed to have like a like a small kind of project show in LA this year that got pushed back, um, and um, I'm supposed to do like a a show at Hair and Nails Gallery in Minneapolis in like early 2021 or something. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like stuff coming on the horizon, um, but I'm also kind of relieved to have a little bit of time to like rest and recuperate after opening the cam show. Um, also because, you know, I, I put so much like time and effort and like, you know, emotions and stuff like into the show um, that I really like am excited that it's A, open in the first place and B, like has this time to be out in the world for people to experience it. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of like waiting to see where that show leads. Um, otherwise just like trying to chill cause like, you know, the world's on fire and like, I'm just trying to stay alive. <laughs> I'm sure many of you are also feeling the same way. Accurate depiction. Um, yeah, who's, who's there? It's Abby. Abby, awesome. Um, I was just wondering like, I'm actually, I'm interested in working with motors in like the future because mm -hmm. they're like, this is really cool. Like I, I saw your stuff too. It was really cool. <laughs> um, but I was just wondering if there was anything like, I guess maybe technical you learned, I guess about the sculpture medium of all the engineering and motory stuff that we, we didn't major in. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, like not an engineer or mechanical engineer or anything. Um, I think, yeah, again, like all of the motors I have are like appropriated from something else. Um, but I think, you know, I'm a person who learns from doing. And so I just like, that's what I started by doing. I like got a massager and I took it apart and I ran it and just kind of watched the gears run. Um, whether or not I could like actually create a moving <laughs> motorized piece like that is questionable. Um, but um, yeah, it's like something I have this like interest in. Um, I don't have like the necessarily like the education to like make them on my own. Um, 
But yeah, I would just say like start by like getting a motor and just like observing how it works. Um, and then what can, what you can do to like, extend that motion. Um, I also watched a lot of like YouTube videos of like how to turn like a circular motion into like um, a reciprocating motion or like how windshield wipers work. Like, um, and so, you know, the internet is, is full of, of information. I, <laughs> so um, a lot of it is just like self-research and, and um, Great, right, thank you. That was actually good help. I will now go research how windshield wipers work. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing. It's super awesome. I also, I will say that um, I did work with, um, for the museum show, I worked with Kevin Harris, who's um, kind of like the expert on like tech stuff. Um, and it was great to be able to like talk to somebody who like knows what he's doing and is like maybe like an electrical engineer. Um, and so, and I would ask like really dumb questions like what's the difference between an AC motor and a DC motor? Cause I really actually had no idea. Um, and I, you know, through the, through the show did learn how to like solder like wires together and stuff. Nothing like fancy, but. Um, Ooh, yeah. you soldered wires. That's so cool. <laughs> I did it. I made them, I made them work. Use motion sensors. I know you learned how to, how to do quite a few things off of YouTube. Um, all right, so we got a question. Out of curiosity, how many tubes of caulking did you use for the column? Oh God, I I must have because I started buying them in bulk, but I like got them all from like Menards. Like I got this like Red Devil brand because like the tubes are like two bucks each. But I must have spent like a thousand dollars. I mean, like I don't know. Like, I was working part time. I had no business spending that much money on on silicone anyway. Um, but I actually, through research, had found that, like, the tubes themselves were cheaper than buying, like, a gallon bucket for some reason. So I just, like, decided to, to like, go the process of, like, cutting off the tip of each tube and, like, putting into the car gun and, like, pumping it out and, like, you know, arguably, like, not the most sustainable choice just in terms of how much plastic waste there was. Um, but... But yeah, and then when I made the um, folding screen, I ended up, did, I got like a, a five gallon bucket of black silicone because that was kind of a special material. But again, this is all like industrial material. Like, you know, there's sites like Smooth On that sell like legit like mold making and casting material. But because I was like broke and freshly out of college, um, I had to do things my own way, um, which is why I ended up using like the really smelly kind, so. You do what you gotta do. All right, we got uh, another question. Do you have any advice for letting for letting projects lead you? I feel like I have uh, things planned out and I struggle with experimenting. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's super real. And I, I am guilty of like what I call being like really art constipated. Like I have all these like ideas and stuff, but I can't like produce them at all. Like. Um, and in that way, I'm putting the cart before the horse. Um, truthfully, like that, I didn't really like break out of that until I graduated school. Um, and I think, you know, the program I was in at WashU was very like conceptual and it was like, you know, you had to be able to like talk about your work in this like theoretical way. Um, because I knew I had to do that, I was like always trying to think of like what something meant before I actually made it. Um, and, you know, of course there's like critiques of like, you know, coming at you every few weeks. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it's great to get out of school because, you know, when you no longer have to like go up and present about your work for a critique, um, it can just like live in, in space and just like, I think, I think projects and pieces kind of need to like sit and like ferment or like, I don't know, they just need to like kind of live out in the world um, and truthfully it's like now I'm making this work um, and the work that I made like two or three years ago when I was in school like now starts to make sense and like there's no way I could have possibly forced that meaning to come out when I was making it um, so I know that's like not like the best answer for somebody who's like in school um, I would you know I would just say like even if you have a, like a silly idea or like an object you want to make, um, just go.
go ahead and make it and like let it sit in your studio um or at least like draw it on like a sketchbook or something um because otherwise it just kind of like you know circles around your brain and um yeah the work needs to like be made first and then the ideas and the theory and the analyzation will come later awesome yeah I think two more questions uh, from Paul Steger. Congratulations on the exhibition. Do the speakers that you use as pedestals also push out the sand, the soundscape or is it the sound piped in from another source? Yeah, so that's something I forgot to mention is that these speakers are like a, they're pedestals, but they also push out the, um, the actual audio itself. Um, and so not all of them, because I think that would be like a little bit overkill, but they all are wired to, um, speaker selectors. I also had to learn a lot about like audio engineering for this or not a lot, just like more than I knew before. Um, but yeah, when you're in the installation, um, anything that all the speakers that are against like the walls are playing like the dance track and then like the center island is playing the um, Korean church audio. Uh, all right, and last question. Uh, do you have any advice for getting into galleries? Advice is, okay, well, this is hard to do nowadays because of COVID, but like go see shows. Um, I think it's hard to like approach galleries like with this like end goal of getting a show there. I think like establishing those relationships because you're truly interested in like what the gallery is doing or like the artists that they're showing there, like, um, you know, try to like be as like sincere as possible, I guess. Um, I think, you know, you, you get out of school and there's this idea that you have to like climb this ladder up into the art world. Um, but like, I think what's important in retrospect is like surrounding yourself with like people who like make you feel good about art, like people who, I guess I, I I was surrounded with a lot of people who were really like negative about the art world and like talked a lot of crap about it and it just made being an artist seem like really awful um and i think once i got away from those people and um yeah i just started meeting people for the sake of meeting people and not because i was trying to like get something out of them i think that's when opportunities really um just came um and and, and when you're out of school and like you're no longer like you know, basically like paying to make art. Um, opportunities are slow, like life moves slower. Um, you might have a show like once a year or something. Um, and that's okay. I mean, every time I do a show, I think it's like the last show I'm ever going to do. And then like, by the time I get to finishing that show, other opportunities come up. So that's kind of like um, a hard part about being an artist is like, you know, you just have to kind of go with the flow um but yeah that, that would be my that's my advice well thank you for talking with us today and hopefully yeah. it won't be any of our last show anytime soon there are plenty <laughs> of extra palm fronds and massages out there for everybody um yeah thank you so much for again taking the time to to listen to me like blabber about my art practice and oh, um I drop my email into the chat if anybody wants to like talk further or just um, to chat or if you want to go see the show together, let me know. It's open until February. They recommend you make reservations to go see it, but um, you can they accommodate walk ins pretty often. So I hope you check it out. Remember that show is up at CAM until February of next year. So try to make it over there and uh, yeah, until next time, uh, thank you for joining us, Rachel, and we hope you have a good rest of the day. Yeah, thank you all. Appreciate all right. it. Bye, guys. We'll see you later.